Good morning. Bonjour. Thank you all for coming. Today, April 4th, marks Refugee Rights Day, a day set aside in Canada to honour the 1985 Supreme Court decision which confirmed that the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms protects the fundamental rights of refugee claimants in Canada, guaranteeing them a fair hearing. Refugee claimants are those who are seeking protection after arriving on Canadian soil, as opposed to those receiving refugee status overseas. They have often survived perilous journeys to seek safety here, and the vast majority, almost three out of four last year, are found to be refugees needing protection. But this special day rings hollow. Forty years after the landmark Supreme Court decision, the rights of refugee claimants in Canada are still not being respected. In a country that prides itself on its leadership and know-how in welcoming and settling refugees from abroad, shockingly, there is no system in place to deal with claimants who arrive at our shores. Instead, we are seeing a false narrative bandied about by political leaders that unfairly labels refugee claimants as a crisis and an approach that is focused either on futile and dangerous attempts to stop refugees from seeking safety here or costly short-term emergency responses that serve neither the public nor refugees. Far too many claimants are ending up homeless or bused to isolated hotels lost in a confusing system without supports or legal counsel. In the past six months alone, two unhoused refugee claimants have died in the Greater Toronto Area for lack of adequate supports. Canadians are rightly appalled. Ces jours-ci, on entend un discours faux et dangereux de la part des politiciens qui qualifient injustement les demandeurs d'asile comme une crise. Et on voit des politiques axées soit sur des tentatives futiles et dangereuses pour les empêcher de chercher de la sécurité ici, ou soit des réponses d'urgence à court terme coûteuses qui ne servent ni le public ni les réfugiés. Beaucoup trop de demandeurs d'asile se retrouvent sans abri ou conduits dans des hôtels isolés et perdus dans un système sans soutien ni conseil juridique. Il est temps de changer à la fois la conversation et l'approche concernant les demandeurs d'asile au Canada et au Québec. It is time to change both the conversation and the approach to refugee claimants in Canada. The good news is that this country is more than capable. I'm here with leading representatives from the membership of the Canadian Council for Refugees, who know firsthand that with some key adjustments to the infrastructure already in place and a proactive mindset, we can redirect wasteful expenses. We can replicate what we know work so that those fleeing persecution are treated fairly and can live and contribute to our country in safety. Today, the CCR is calling for a coordinated national approach to ensure the right to asylum with dignity. This requires contributions from federal, provincial, municipal governments and civil society, but federal leadership will be key and it is time for Ottawa to step up. We will speak to five key areas that require action. First, establish reception centres to orient arrivals and coordinate services. Second, fund and replicate successful transitional housing models. Third, make claimants eligible for the support services that are already offered to all other newcomers. Ensure legal aid is available across the country. And lastly, streamline the application and determination process. Let me call on Alan Reeser McDowell of Matthew House Ottawa to discuss our first two recommendations. In collaboration with provincial and municipal governments, as well as civil society, we recommend that the federal government establish reception centers to provide emergency shelter, triage, orientation, and referral services for newly arrived refugee claimants in major cities across the country. Having a center to receive expert guidance upon arrival will help refugee claimants get and stay on track with their claims and settlement process. A centre responsible for coordination can also play a critical role in ensuring services are appropriate and complementary, leading to better outcomes for refugees and very likely with significant cost savings for governments. The work underway to establish a reception centre for the Peel region with federal funding is a positive sign and should be replicated. The City of Ottawa and community partners are ready to establish and operate a reception centre and I know this request has been submitted to the IRCC. We also recommend that the federal government provide sustained funding for transitional housing for refugee claimants, scaling up existing successful models which will complement the reception centres. Over the last three decades, civil society has on its own initiative developed a network of at least 35 organisations across the country 
that offer short-term and transitional housing for refugee claimants. Initial findings indicates that these programs operate at a fraction of the cost of hotels or homeless shelters. For example, at Matthew House, Ottawa, where I work, average cost per bed is less than $35 a day, yet programs like ours often refer, uh, respond far better to the needs of refugee claimants who are newly arrived. These programs typically provide food, connections to a lawyer, getting help with a work permit and finding a job. Perhaps most importantly, they provide community of support that is critical to well-being and mental health. Residents are also supported in securing longer-term housing, leading to shorter stays in transitional housing and easing pressures on emergency shelters and related services. With predictable long-term government funding, successful models for refugee claimant transitional housing can be scaled up and replicated with immediate benefits. Next, I'll call on Loli Rico, who's the founder of the FCJ Refugee Centre in Toronto, to speak to our recommendation around services. Loli? Yes, uh, good morning. The federal government we have right now through the Immigration and Refugee Citizenship of Canada, service, they fund uh, services for settlement, aid, uh, settlement uh, uh, services for uh, newcomers. And one of the things is that they have a provided wraparound services to them. Refugee claimants are not eligible for that services, which have been an impact on the beginning of their lives. We are asking, and we have approved right now with the uh, case of Ukrainian, that they were providing service, settlement services to them and with the purpose that they can start integrating into the Canadian society. Vast majority of refugee claimants, they become the future Canadian. What we are asking is that the federal government make eligible refugee claimants to have access to the settlement services and they can have a very dignified life at the beginning when they come to Canada. That's what we are asking. This is as a, in the FCJ Refugee Centre. We are a few re, uh, houses, that refugee houses that we provide the minimum or basic services to them and they have been successful at the end of when they become Canadian. What we are asking is to have a wraparound services because in that way, we won't see situations that they end up homeless or they end up in the, in, on, the, on the street or even to lose their lives because they come and they don't have access to these services. And that's what we are asking as a Canadian Council for Refugees. We have been doing this request since I'm in Canada 34 years and we, keep asking, and this is the momentum that the federal government can make a change. I, good morning, bonjour. Uh, my name is Jenny Jeans, and I'm the Vice President of the Canadian Council for Refugees. Uh, je suis la Vice Présidente du Conseil Canadien pour les Réfugiés, and I work with one of our over 200 member organizations, Action Réfugié Montréal. Je suis ici aujourd'hui pour représenter euh, les membres du CCR, plus de 200 organismes qui travaillent à travers le Canada avec les demandeurs d'asile. Legal representation, effective legal representation, is essential for fair and effective refugee determination and for coordination of all of these systems. Many people don't realize the complexity of refugee claims, things like, uh, are you eligible for state protection? Is there an internal flight alternative? These are notions that would be complicated for Canadians, let alone refugee claimants who've just arrived here seeking protection. Currently, there is a severe shortage of legal aid across the country, either in provinces where it exists it's underfunded and many people don't have access to effective legal representation. In some provinces, like Saskatchewan, for example, it simply does not exist. To be able to ensure that people can promptly and correctly present their refugee claim and have access to a fair hearing, fair refugee determination down the line, it's essential that they have legal representation. We're calling on the federal government to ensure funding for legal aid, multi-year funding that's stable, predictable, linked to the number of claims, and reflects the actual cost of determining refugee status. 
In provinces where there is no provincial legal aid system, there are alternatives. There are currently some models that can be built on, for example, direct federal funding of the Halifax Refugee Clinic, because there is not legal aid for refugee claims in Nova Scotia. Even introducing forms, bureaucratic forms to start the process, require lawyers or effective legal counsel to ensure that people don't fall through the cracks. I'll speak then to our last recommendation, which relates to the initial processing of refugee claims that's overly complex. And if simplified, reducing the paperwork, reducing the number of questions, repetitive questions that are asked at the outset, it would allow people easier access to the claim system and easier access to the paperwork that they need so that they can meet their basic needs and not fall through the cracks of homelessness or other uh, dire situations that we're, we're seeing currently. Alors, euh, je vais juste réitérer le besoin d'un système qui est coordonné pour s'assurer d'une représentation légale qui est efficace et juste et qui s'assure que les personnes peuvent présenter leurs demandes d'asile et avoir accès à leurs besoins de base. Merci. Thank you, Jenny. So just to close, we know in today's global context that Canada will continue to receive people who are seeking protection from persecution. We know that refugees have a right to asylum, and we know what to do to ensure due process and provide the supports that set them up for success. Canadians are expecting a plan, not stopgap measures, and it is long past time to put in place a comprehensive, coordinated, and cost-effective system that treats refugee claimants with dignity and fairness where all levels of government and community groups are playing a role. This is what we have proposed today. We are ready to do our part. You can find our full recommendations in the brief that is linked in our press release, and we are keen for your questions. Merci. We'll now take questions uh, from Zoom. If you have a question, please use raise and function. Nicholas, do you have a question? Hi, good morning. Um, I, I just wonder whether you know you, you um, can provide us any cost and benefit analysis, you know, with the action plan versus now, you know. Um, with the federal funding um, uh, primarily focusing on, you know, housing asylum seekers in the hotel system? Absolutely. Alan? Thanks, Nicholas. I um, would say just at the beginning that it's very difficult to do a comprehensive analysis because the information has been hard to access in terms of current costs. I would point back to the comment that I made in terms of some examples that we do know in terms of costs for organizations like ours. Um, so I mentioned at Matthew House we've done an analysis and it costs about $35 a day to provide a bed, food, wraparound supports, basically all of the supports and or referrals to other places that are needed including lawyers, employment supports. $35 a day is a fraction of the cost in comparison to what's being spent in emergency shelters, overflow shelters, hotels, and the outcomes are better. And so I think at this point, until we get much better numbers on the actual costs that are spent, I can't do a real apples to apples comparison, but it's very clear that we can do it uh, with better outcomes at much less cost with the current models that are being uh, applied across the country. And as I mentioned, there are 35 organizations like ours doing this. So I think focusing on scaling those up, replicating those effective programs and building on that expertise is an excellent next step. The only thing I will add is that the, the question is more than about um, the amount of cost. Absolutely, because we all know the costs of hotel these days. Absolutely, we know that civil society run models will run at a fraction of the cost. Um, of emergency measures. The other point is about long-term predictability. So emergency measures are not only 
expensive by default because they are planned suddenly in a kind of a context of you can have this money and it will run out on March 31st. But they make it impossible for municipalities and civil society partners to plan longer term. So everything starts and stops. And so the other way that we know that will be cost effective is if we create long term predictable funding, we can actually just create the infrastructure that will be able to uh, properly service and absorb those claimants and their needs, taking the pressure off homeless shelters. So it's a combination of um, lower costs and more predictable funding that will enable much better outcomes, as Alan has identified. And, and what would be the... So, oh, can I have a follow-up question? Please do. Um, and what would be the consequences, you know, for Canada uh, if the federal government or the three levels of government do not act on, you know, do not have an, uh, an action plan? on this issue, a national plan on this issue? What would be the downside and the consequences of uh, the in inaction? I think we know the answer to that because what we're seeing right now are the consequences of a lack of a plan. And so we've had for years increasing number of refugee claimants arriving. Uh, we know that this is part of a global trend uh, with more forced migrants around the world. Canada will never see a large percentage of the world's forced migrants, but we are seeing uh, more people coming to claim asylum in the country. Uh, without a plan, what we've seen is increased uh, amount of homelessness among refugee claimants. And this is, we see, you know, things pop up in the media with homelessness in major cities like Toronto last summer. And this has been something that's been building for years. This is not actually new. And many of us who have been in this work for years if not decades we're saying i would say for years if not decades that this is a problem that needs to be addressed without a plan without a national plan for what happens when refugee claimants first arrive in the country we will continue to see significant amount of homelessness among claimants and that is bad for the refugees it's bad for the communities that we're in but it also puts a lot of strain on all of the resources that we have um, for example for emergency shelters who need to be there to serve people that are homeless in the communities. And if we have ho refugee claimants who end up in the shelters and on the streets, it really strains all of the shelters and the related systems. And it's not necessary. We know that we can actually house, support, divert refugee claimants from, from homelessness because we have examples across the country that are every day doing this important work. So I think, um, Nicholas, in the end, it's we, we know what no, no plan looks like, and we have a vision, and I think it's something that we know we can implement immediately. I'd just like to add that, you know, new programs, of course, they mean, uh, they seem like they mean new costs, but we have, for example, many of our members seeing claimants across the country who are languishing for months in hotels because of a lack of service, where uh, we on the ground, our membership, are used to dealing day by day with things like a misplaced work permit, a glitch with a medical exam, things that can help people get on their feet quickly, move out of hotels, find jobs, and get started uh, with their life in the community. On the other side, when we look at refugee determination, and we see that last year, almost 75% of refugee claims that were heard by the Immigration and Refugee Board were accepted, and yet we're denying access to basic services to claimants during the year two, sometimes more, that they're waiting for that final decision. It means that they're not getting a good start in terms of their life in Canada, when most of them will go on to become permanent residents and Canadian citizens. We're not giving their children a good start either by depriving them of services. Can I add something? <clears throat> I think it's one of the things is that in the plan, if we have a plan, as Alan was saying, we had already that we, the government had been reacting with the numbers and the influx of refugee claimants. And as a federal government that has been participating internationally in all the conventions, we, they know that there is an in, in, increasing of refugees or a force movement. And one of the things is that they should be sitting together, the three levels of government, municipalities, the provinces, and the federal government, but as well the civil society, because we are the ones at the end welcoming them and providing the services. If we have a good plan, they won't waste the money. 
because if we have a plan like a, we can we can have a, a plan where if it is a big influx we can move and open the spaces and to keep it with housing refugee claimants and then to provide the, the services that will be a better movement but if there is a, a reduced number which i don't see it in the future of refugee claimants you can use the same infrastructure to have a, a housing or more permanent housing for refugees or for people who are homeless but you need to have that flexibility and the, when we say wasting money is because the hotels is a private sector and of course will be a more a, expensive than if you have a specific places where you can accommodate the refugee claimants do you have more questions nicholas uh, yes, I, I just wonder, you know, I think the general public <coughs> has the impression that is a volume issue that we are seeing the last couple of years. Um, you know, as I think as the number shows, we, you know, there's a 50% increase of asylum seekers in Canada between 2022 and 2023. Um, and I wonder, like, to what extent is a, is a, um, is an issue with the, 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 the sheer volume of asylum seekers arriving and to what extent uh, we can, you know, uh, the, the lack of coordination and collaboration between, you know, the, the, the different levels of governments and the civil society uh, contributing to, to the, the, the situation, uh, the conditions we are seeing now? The volumes are higher than we have seen, but we are absolutely confident that these are numbers that Canada uh, can absorb and know how to how to process fairly. The refugee claimant numbers, even at their peak last year, are one sixth the number of temporary uh, temporary um, workers that we have in the country. Um, and we know that the main reason that the that the systems uh, that it can seem overwhelming is because there is no plan. So when you have uh, refugee claimants arriving in large numbers and there is no infrastructure planned with how to coordinate them, it creates the feeling that the volume is too high. But if we, we know very well from the kind of numbers that our colleagues at FCJ um, and uh, Matthew House have been sharing, that actually with coordinated plan and infrastructure that's scaled up, we have all of the skills and know-hows to receive claimants, house them, help them find their work permits and, and help them on their way to set up for successful lives in Canada. So the volume is a red herring. The volume is only a problem when you haven't made a plan. And we all know that when you fail to plan, you're essentially planning for failure. There is a better way and we've laid out uh, very clearly at least five key areas where building on existing infrastructure and tapping the knowledge and expertise that exists in Canada, we can uh, fairly process and provide asylum with dignity. If I could just add, when we look at volume, we have the very recent example of Ukrainians who were welcomed by Canada in very large numbers, where there was very quickly a system put in place, kiosks at the airport, emergency funding on arrival, organizations mandated to help find housing and work permits, with very large numbers of people coming in a very short period of time. So with the proper coordination, it can work, even with a larger number, and as Loli said, with that flexibility, it can also be scaled down. Thank you. One more, Nicholas? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks all.